Wilkinson. How you doing? <laughs> Good to have you here. Phil Perone, how are you? I am well, Monica. How are you? Who's Hi. this girl with you? Are you on a date? That is, I've been working with AI um, imaging, and that is an AI image of a pirate lady. Well, that's pretty nice. darn good. It's, yeah, it turned out fairly good. I've been doing, I'm, I'm becoming addicted, I have to admit. Yeah, hey. I, I'm i not doing so much with the art image, because I, no matter how hard I try, I'm still, it's like I fail in that in real life, hmm. and I'm failing at it in AI. But I do enjoy uh, the research and uh using i've been using a lot for chat inside of chat and trying different things so that's been a ton of fun we're going to focus on some ai in fact we're doing a session the first week in october here so uh we'd love to have uh some ideas with the are you using mid journey or what are you using uh no i'm not i'm using um stable diffusion okay yeah and i just i tell you what i just gave a um well it was a, just a 30 minute brief uh, yesterday to my company on this so I do have some material if you're interested. That's very good, Phil. I'm sure we'll call on you for it. Okay. Um, yeah, I'd be happy they, to. Uh, our game con that we're doing that starts um, two days. Yeah, two days. Uh, actually, we used a lot. Our game designer used a lot of stable diffusion for our imagery, and it's just stunning. Yeah. Just really stunning. So we're really excited about it. Julianne Chapman, how are you doing? Doing well. Glad to be glad that you're back. I miss you guys. <laughs> I know it's been too long, too long. Jack Galto, great to see your face, sir. No, oh, thank you. Very, I, thank I'm, you I'm on. Too. I'm on, on. I'm looking for AI th uh, information every day. <laughs> yeah, you're using it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm doing research. Yeah. Uh, Me too. Me too. I'm loving it. Loving it. Susan Skinner, glad you're here. Tabitha Dragonberry, Hello. glad to have you back. We're so excited. Uh, we've got two special guests that will be leading us today, Jeff Master Monaco, who is one of our master craftsmen, and then also uh, his colleague, Andrew Everett, who uh, has, has taken our surveyor course, but he works closely uh, with Jeff. Are you in the Innovation Center also, Andrew? Yes, I am. Yeah. Center for Innovation or Innovation? How's it uh, supporting? Center for Instructional Innovation. Center for Instructional Innovation at Augusta University. So we're really excited to have uh, both of those individuals with us today for our grand reopening of the Game Garage. We've done a lot of restructuring and thinking. Well, we've done a lot of thinking over the past year. I can tell you that much. Renee's done a ton of research and work on what can be done differently. I send articles and books to Jonathan on a weekly basis about what we could be doing differently. So we're really excited about all that's going to be coming up. And the reason that we wanted to make the change was because we see the power that our community of master craftsmen is. I mean, it's just a powerhouse of interaction and engagement and learning and helping and so much so that sometimes I have to mute it because I got I gotta get stuff done. Y'all, y'all just talk over there amongst yourselves. I gotta, I gotta move over here for a bit. And because it's so powerful, we really wanted to extend that more to our our larger community too. And so I'll be sharing with you uh, after we do a little bit of escape room fun, I'll share with you more about what's to come. But tonight we are going to be going through, uh, Jeffrey's going, Jeff is going to share some of, uh, of what he's done with the uh, Unlocking Collaborative Care. It was an escape room for 175 students. Uh, 150. This 150 around. students, graduate, medical, all different, right? Uh, well, no, they actually, they were all, I think, freshmen in this case, but they're all uh, allied health and medical students. Allied health and medical students, that's right. And so to get us rolling well, on that, share it with the public, but then they we are going it. to we are going to go back to a face to face scenario. So Tracy Stokely, remember the good old days of face to face escape rooms? And that's what Jeff uh, and Andrew designed. This was a face to face encounter for these 150 students. And so uh, to get us going this afternoon, this evening, I want us to start with that question. Jonathan's going to move us into breakouts just for a few minutes. And I want that to be the topic of discussion. And that is, 
have you done a live escape room? It could be uh, like went to a center where, you know, it's built. It was built for that. It was a location that's commercially been developed at, as an escape room. Or it could be something uh, like we did. And Tracy was part of that as the, it was a pop-up escape room. That was at our very first game of con in Chicago back in 18. And so, and we are doing the pop-up escape room in GameCon in Orlando. I mean, in New Orleans next week, New Orleans, that's where I'm flying to New Orleans on Monday, we're going to do a pop-up escape room at a brewery again. So uh, we're really looking forward to it, but that's my question is, have you done a live escape room where you were physically in a room or in a, with a group of people trying to, to break out, to solve the puzzles, to, to, to finish it, to complete it, whatever that looked like, to solve the final mystery. So Jonathan, can you move us into breakouts for just a few minutes? Get to know the people. Uh, we'll be working as we solve some of Jeff's puzzles that he came up with for us uh, this evening also. So get to know the people you'll be working with. Just a few minutes to say hi, and then we'll come back and we'll get rolling. All right, talk with me about uh, live escape rooms. Who has experienced one? And what was that venue like? Go ahead, Melody. Hmm. Uh, so this was several years ago that, that I did my first live one. And, um, you know, we were in that particular instance, not competing against anyone, but it was just a timed event. Uh, I think, you know, we were going to like die from cyanide poisoning or something if we didn't get it in time, low risk. <laughs> and so, um, you know, th that was exciting. And we had like, you know, maybe five people. So we were able to kind of divide and conquer in that live one. Um, in ones that I've been involved in more recently, you know, we had smaller teams. And so we kind of, each puzzle was group noggin effort to figure it out in time. All right, good. Very nice. So was it more of a... Um... The cyanide one, was that uh, like a venue you went to or was that? Yeah. Yeah. Small, you know, small room yeah. and um, locked in lights, well appointed. I always think that the um, the charity goodwill runs must be a lot of fun for those things because they're, you know, they're so scripted to look like the cabin in the woods or the <laughs> scary house and so um, I appreciate that to give you a more tangible feel for the escape. Yeah. Room. I know when I was first researching, uh, thinking about, you know, what would it look like to do an escape room? Just the, you know, things have to be able to be put back together again and people will destroy things. I mean, just like all the lessons learned from it. It was really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Who else has been to a live escape room? Tracy, tell us about it. Uh, I've been to a couple of the paid ones, um, so with friends, and they're very linear, so you have to go in a particular contrived order to get out, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> Literally out, but yeah. Yeah, which is interesting, because that's the way our game is designed for Game of Con next week. We're doing two. We're doing a... Mardi Gras Mayhem, which is going to run for the 48 hours of the whole event. And it is linear and you actually can't solve it until the last speaker has been up. So it's designed. Mm -hmm. uh, but then uh, like the one that we did together back in 18, we really could go any direction, right? It was right. Ever, whatever you could solve first, right. uh, both interesting. I'm wondering who, which kind appeals to which people more, right? Like high order. I think it like depends on what yeah. it is. I mean, yeah. The ones when you go in and pay for, it's you against the clock. So it's that and it's linear. And that's yeah. how they typically work everywhere. Because they have them almost in every city now, I think. Yeah. Unless it's a very small place. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many popping we up. We probably have four or five just here in Cincinnati. Yeah. That's good. Or probably more than that. But yeah. Yeah. All right. Hey, well, hey a, quick, a quick question for <laughs> Melody and Tracy. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of game, when you're designing games, you really want to get the experience articulated. What are you feeling, you know, uh, when you're playing the game? So I'd just be interested when you're in that escape room, what kind of emotions or feelings do you have? I definitely uh, felt frustrated and anxious at different points 
when you just can't figure it out, you or it's a it's a um, puzzle, and you're you're not even really sure where to start with it, and you're looking at everyone else, and they're looking back at you, and so you definitely feel the the heat of things. You've got this huge timer on the wall, so you're thinking, "Gosh, I've got to like figure this out." Or again, death by cyanide poisoning, and so um, it's kind of funny, similar to. VR really, where you just very quickly stop thinking about it as being kind of a weird looking avatar and you're, you're in like, this is real life. I could lose my life tonight and, you know, leave my family without a point person. And so it, you do get emotional in it. Uh, even though it's completely contrived, the room, you know, looks like a, a bad Scooby-Doo. Uh, <laughs> that's a good, that's good. I love it. Wouldn't it be fun to start releasing a, like a, just like fog, you know, how you make fog with dry ice. Wouldn't it be fun to start releasing that into the People room? People would lose their minds. <laughs> I think the black lights come is, on and like the fog. It is immersive. Uh, yeah. The oyster yeah. cult in the background. No. Yeah. The yeah. Room first one's destroyed. always harder than the second one, I think. Yeah. When you go to a different, totally different one, but. Yeah. And there's some we didn't, we didn't escape the first one. The second one we did. We had to think differently. Yeah. Some people's brains are like wired that way. Like they know, they kind of know what to be looking for or know how to, how to think through it. And the rest of us are just trying to find things to help those people is my role. It's like, what can I find to help these people? Sam, did you have your hand up? Yeah, no, I just wanted to to share that. I think that's what I love most about it that that it is immersive and that you do feel like you're in a different place, like you're you know you're you're now in whatever that world is. And so I really enjoy that. I like the ones with the espionage. So we we did um, uh, the Orlando one, and uh, there is the, on iDrive there is a place that does like a whole lot of rooms there. And my favorite was the you know you have to like be a spy and you have to figure out you know who's trying to take over the world with, you know, who's, who has, who's dealing drugs and, and weapons and stuff. And, and so it was mostly linear, but there were lots of different elements where you had to figure stuff out, not necessarily in the same order. Um, so it was really well done. And, you know, we had, we actually went from one room to the next through a tunnel and stuff like that. So it, it became kind of real, you know, like, it, so it was great. It was fun. And we, we were against the clock and you did feel the panic. You know, but at least that's great. Yeah, that's really good. I love it. So we're, what they're saying, I guess, Jack, is, you know, they were able to create that magic circle where people entered it and accepted that this is real. You know, this is the, this is the rules. We're going to play by it. So that's good. I'm going to bring up Renee up. Renee's going to introduce Jeff for us. Renee is our uh, coordinator. She directs all of our programs at Sententia and uh, if you've got ideas for leading a game garage, we, of course, always love to hear about them going forward. we That's one of the reasons that we started Game Garage was because we knew there was brilliance and creativity out there that we had not met yet. And we want to meet you. So uh, if you've got ideas, Renee's, I'll, I'll put it in the chat for you, but it's bridgemaster at sententiagames.com. And you can always reach out to her and she'll spend time with you figuring out you know, what you've got and how to make it work. And uh, she's just really committed to this, the organization and, and the game garage. So uh, Renee, go ahead. You can introduce Jeff. I'll, I'll be quiet now. Well, I think he did a great job of introducing Jeff earlier. Um, and I want to give him time to to get on to this because um, I think we probably have about a half hour before the, the that big breakout, Jeff. Um, but I just wanted to say some of you are familiar with Jeff's work in the, um, the, the, piece that he created for the world literature class at Augusta. And, um, and that was like kind of like little cartoony characters wandering the holy lands and, and, and learning about ancient world, ancient religious history. And um, so some of you will have experienced that. And, and today is just another treat that Jeff has, has come up with. His colleague, Andrew Everett, um, I've had an opportunity to chat with earlier today. And the two of them have done an a masterful job in creating this hands-on experience that you're about to have a peek at. Go Jeff. All right. So I want to start by uh, asking a question. Um, anybody who wants to answer, um, I guess without giving out too much or violating HIPAA or anything, uh, what was your last doctor visit like? <laughs> was it good? Was it bad? Uh, 
They could always mix my my blood pressure go up. So when they take your blood pressure, it's up higher than it usually is. <laughs> in and out in 15 minutes. Oh, okay. So very quick. Not a lot of not a lot of chitter chatter. Uh, ours are down 10 minutes now at our clinic. The aim for. Okay. I'm anybody, gonna say expensive. Else? It was expensive. Crazy. <laughs> Somebody, somebody posted rushed. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Well, another question. Let's see. Uh, when was the last time that you had to rely on someone else to accomplish a task? And how did, how did that go? Anyone? Was it good? Was it bad? Frustrating? Should we talk about last night's email? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> nope. The team pulled together. Monica kept saying, just tell me like you're talking to a third grader. Tell me like you're talking to a third grader. I need to understand this. Yeah. Okay. Notice that no well, one's face lit up when you ask that question. I think that answers it. <laughs> yes, very much. Well, these two questions are actually going to shape a, a little bit of what we're going to talk about today. Um so uh, again, to kind of reiterate, reiterate who I am, uh, I'm Jeff Master Monaco. I am uh, the director for the Center of Instructional Innovation uh, at Augusta, as Augusta University. Um, I'm also a, a Sententia Master Craftsman. Um, and so I am from Augusta University, which is a comprehensive research university um, in uh, Augusta, Georgia. And it actually is uh, Georgia's only public academic health center. The unit that I and Andrew belong to uh, is uh, the Center for Instructional Innovation. Um, and there's the, our, our fancy mission statement, but essentially what we do is enhance instruction. So we'll come along with faculty um, to help them enhance their courses, whether it's through instructional design, uh, multimedia or video production, which is what Andrew does, or possibly uh, gamification. And, and so, you know, we hope to enhance instruction and make things better for, um, for students. So what we're going to talk about today uh, is uh, I'd like to showcase uh, the creation and the impact of uh, Escape the Exam Room, which is an escape room experience uh, that we we created for Allied the Allied Health, the College of Allied Health here at Augusta University, uh, and look at our, um, <clears throat> the impact that it had for teaching collaboration and patient-centered patient care to, uh, to medical students. And how we're going to do that uh, is we're going to have three tasks that we'll hope to accomplish during this presentation. Uh, we'll talk about the problem that we were given and uh, the learning objectives that we were, uh, we were setting out to, to, to meet. Um, we'll look at the design and the development that we went through, uh, you know, some of the, the pitfalls and some of the, the considerations that we had to, to go through to design the escape room. Uh, and then we'll look inside the escape room and see some of the clues and, and how all that came together. Okay, so um, we we kind of talked about doctors' visits before, and um, a lot of people said that they were rushed, um, that uh, you know they were in and out super quick. So you know, not a lot of chitter chatter. Um, I'll tell you a, a quick, hopefully a super quick story about my um, last kind of run in with doctors and things. I've been having some knee issues and have been going to the the knee doctor for a little bit. And, Treatment this, treatment that. Eventually, it was decided that I had to have surgery. So go through all the the blood work that you do pre surgery, and I'm on the phone with some some you know poor lady who had to talk to me about this is what's going to happen before surgery. This 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 this. Oh, and you're diabetic, by the way. No, uh, as a matter of fact, I'm not diabetic. Oh well, maybe I shouldn't be the one to have told you this, but your blood work came back and your A1Cs were twelve. Well, I mean, I don't know what that means. That sounds good to me. But apparently, it means you're pre-diabetic. And so luckily, everything, you know, my blood sugar was like 190, which I guess is not good either. So everything came down enough for me to have the surgery. But they suggested afterward that I go to primary care physician. I didn't have one. So I got set up with one. Um, I'm sitting and talking to him. And he's very good. He's sitting there with me. He's taking a lot of time learning who I am, talking about all this, all that. I kind of start to recount this knee surgery journey. And it, it comes up about taking cortisone shots. And he's like, well, you know, cortisone shots would throw your blood out of whack, probably for a good three months. 
you know, and by this time I'd already made some lifestyle changes because I, um, despite having two full tattoo sleeves, I'm very afraid of needles and didn't want to be giving myself shots for the rest of whatever. So I'd already kind of started losing weight, but it turns out that I actually had no blood sugar problem at all with the cortisone shots that had kind of thrown everything out of whack. This other doctor didn't take the time to even think about that. This one who'd taken the time to just sit down and talk to me and learn my story. All of a sudden, I don't have, uh, you know, I don't have diabetes anymore. Yay. Let's all eat a bunch of ice cream. So that's this patient patient centered care, him sitting down and taking time with me. And so that's, you know, where care teams, they work to know and treat the full patient. It's individualized, comprehensive care that they, they, they create individualized care plans, uh, mental health and social needs. They receive equal attention. It's not just looking at numbers. I think somebody just said, you know, they looked at their blood pressure. You know, they're not just looking at the chart. They're looking at the full full patient. Um, and the other thing is interprofessional education. And this is where uh, it, it requires an emphasis on teamwork. Uh, and a lot of problems that they have in medical schools uh, is that they suffer from a lack of a cross discipline curriculum structure. And so uh, CII was actually approached by Allied Health uh, to help create some interactive experience to teach these skills uh, and more specifically to create this experience for what they called Interprofessional Education Day. So this was a full day of these Allied Health students getting together and learning how to work together, uh, you know, from the disciplines like uh, dietetics, uh, physical uh, therapy, uh, physical, uh, uh, you know, assistance, PAs. Uh, so all those learning how to, to work together and to listen to each other. And so they wanted um, a way to teach these skills to them and to make it kind of an immersive experience. So um, we had some learning objectives that we had to meet. And, and these were what they gave us. They wanted the students at the end of whatever experience that we came up with, they wanted to be, them to be able to define collaborative medicine, recognize the importance of evaluating patients holistically. You know, this is that talking about, you know, looking at their health conditions, but also their personal story, and taking, taking, you know, all that into context. They wanted them to learn to collaborate with each other, um, identify how, uh, you know, patients' personal and environmental context could impact their treatment plan. Uh, you know, and they wanted them to be able to discuss the role of empathy in creating a treatment plan, um, you know, considering, considering again, considering the full, the full patient, kind of like uh, my doctor's visit. He, he took some time to hear my story and then, you know, was able to kind of figure out what was going on with me. So how do you make a bunch of medical students learn to work together? I mean, you lock them into a room and you basically tell them to figure it out, you know, that they, that they need to figure out on their own on how to, how to get out. So um, based on that, we came up with uh, Escape the Exam Room. So we uh, were going to create a uh, escape room experience that these students would uh, experience during this, this full uh, day of uh, interdisciplinary education. Um, so designing the escape room experience, um, some of the things that we had to consider uh, other than the learning objectives when we we're putting this thing together, um, we would have students from uh, a, a lot of different disciplines, medical students, occupational therapy, physical therapy, dietetics, uh, physician's assistants. Um, we wanted to craft the experience so that students new to their discipline uh, could be successful. So, you know, a lot of these uh, were going to be freshmen, and so they might not have as much medical knowledge as, as they would, you know, further down the line. So we wanted to make sure that this would be something that they would be able to, to get out of. Um, we're designing with a limited unknown budget, uh, as a, a, a lot of you can probably relate to <clears throat> in any kind of project, you know, that you that you have a budget for that it's it, it can be limited. And a lot of times you don't even know what you're spending. Uh, and we had to accommodate around 150 students during the day long event. So part of what we had to figure out was uh, how are we going to accommodate this many students and ensure that they they were able to go through the experience and that learning was happening. Um, so we had we decided to uh, we were running six rooms with six students in each room. Uh, we had four rounds of this. Um, we wanted to make sure that we created an immersive narrative. And a, a lot of you were talking about the storyline that kind of existed in these escape rooms. You know, you became immersed in into what was going on so we wanted to make uh, a, a narrative that was believable and that everybody could buy into and that 
you know, was was part of this um, interdisciplinary experience and uh, uh, patient centered care, ex you know, experience that they were going to go through. Uh, we wanted to design as a part of this experience a way to ensure that learning happens. And we'll we'll talk about that as we kind of talk about how the, the day went and the learning experience went. Um, and uh, a lot of you, when you were talking about your uh, escape room experience, um, we're talking about when you first started that it was you're racing against the clock. Everybody was just kind of running around the room and trying to, to figure out what to, to solve next. Because we had to move so many people through at one time, you know, every every student had an, you know, the the every student group had an hour to get through, and then we had to get set up and run another round through. This had to be designed linear. Um, so kind of like the what Monica was talking about, about what they're designing for New Orleans. You you had to get to one clue before you got to the next clue, before you got to the next clue. And designing it that way uh, allowed it to be reset very quickly. So uh, let's talk about narrative. Meet John Grasso, um, our lovable, lovable, you know, curmudgeon patient who uh, is not complying with his uh, his treatment plan. Oh, the the joys of being the oldest on the staff uh, and having Photoshop. So uh, I became the one that was uh, was elected to be be the patient. Uh, but the 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 goal of the room, and, and you know, in John Grasso, we we decided that we were going to craft. Um, our escape room around around uh, John Grasso, and so we even went as far um, as creating videos and things, which we'll look at in a bit to kind of get into his story. And essentially, uh, the students are part of the team of Dr. Larry Lockhart, and he uh, does not know why John Grasso has not been compliant with uh, his treatment plan. And so he's asking him to to help out, but he's hidden clues uh, as to, to he's a little forgetful. So he's hidden clues all throughout this exam room uh, that they're going to be uh, locked in and, and, and asked to, to find. And then at the end of this, use those uh, those clues to to figure out why John is possibly not complying with his treatment plan and and hopefully come up with a new one. So um, we'll talk about a little bit about the materials and the resources that we have to, to put this together. Uh, we were actually dealing with an unknown budget. And so a lot of what you're going to see uh, was created in-house. And so we you know, created our own patient charts and we're able to print those out. Um, the riddle cards and things that you'll see uh, were created in-house and we we're able to print those out and, and, and build our kits with those. Those included our, our puzzle pieces. Um, our boxes and we had uh, ciphers um, and actually we had a, a great resource the first year that we ran this in a um, uh, uh, Dr. Bill Gray who ran our curriculum lab and was actually able to 3D print that cipher that you see here and also um, a, a cryptic and that's the cryptic that you see that was uh, actually 3D printed that we used the first year um, we actually found out uh, despite being told not to uh, strong arm anything that students were able to break the uh, the cryptic. So the next year we actually were able to find some uh, some uh, inexpensive cryptics from Amazon and and were able to order those. So the second year, that's what you see was what we used. Um, and so again, all the puzzle pieces and eye charts and things we were able to create in house. Uh, some other materials and resources we had were were these kits that we uh, built together. One of the the goals for uh, Putting this together was eventually that um, even though we were involved this second year that we just ran it, actually, gosh, it was a few weeks ago, um, I think the idea is that next year we wouldn't be, be doing any of this at all. We've, we've hopefully built a, an organized kit that we can just hand off to somebody and they're able to run, run a room themselves, which included a, a playbook that kind of goes uh, play by play on how the day, you know, the experience should go, how uh, the room should be reset, you know, where all the clues should be put and everything. Um, and the other resource that we were uh, lucky to have is our uh, interdisciplinary uh, simulation center, which is a, a simulation center here on campus um, that they use to, to simulate different scenarios and is, is used to, to, uh, to train these different um, uh, students of these, of these different disciplines. Um, another resource that we were very lucky to have uh, were our staff. 
So each room was able to have a monitor uh, that monitored uh, the, the progress and were able to give hints uh, to um, the, uh, the teams if they needed them. They were uh, <clears throat> allowed to have up to three hints. Each time uh, that they received a hint, they were docked, docked a, a minute from their time. Uh, we had uh, access to uh, teaching assistants and students who were able to help us quickly reset these rooms. So that that was a, a big assist in us being able to run run super quick through the, through the uh, the day and make sure that we were able to to accommodate all these students. Uh, and we had uh, faculty from Allied Health who conducted the sessions uh, before and after uh, the the reflection sessions again to kind of make sure that that learning was actually happening. Those learning objectives were being met. And there's a few of our staff that were able to to monitor through the the simulation center. All right, so we're going to talk uh, about the uh, experience itself. So uh, the experience started with a, a pre-brief where um, there were the uh, the faculty from Allied Health kind of gave, gave some leading questions and explained the concept of um, explained the concept of uh, uh, you know interprofessional collaboration and of uh, patient-centered care. And then they were also uh, shown a, a pre-brief video which set up the storyline uh, and introduced John Grasso and Dr. Lockhart and what their, uh, their goals were gonna be uh, for the escape room experience and to show them the big, uh, the big prize of the trophy for the, the quickest team, which you can see there, which uh, there was uh, much, much excitement about, believe me. Um, so the students were given uh, 50 minutes to escape. And like I said, they, they were given a pre-brief and an introduction. Uh, and at the end, uh, you know, which I think uh, I was the part that I was most excited about, they were given a debrief and a, a group reflection. So you could actually see uh, and, and hear from them what they learned. And then they were also given the, the project of, of developing based on what they had learned in their experience, a new treatment plan for, for John Grasso. So we're going to go ahead and look at the um, pre-brief video here. Ugh, I hate coming here. I just don't have time for this. This is John Grasso, a 55-year-old man with a history of noncompliance with treatment. This morning, he came to the clinic where you work for a follow-up appointment with his primary care physician, Dr. Larry Lockhart. Uh, I just hope Dr. Lockhart doesn't tell me again that I need to take better care of myself. It's frustrating to hear that every single time. Uh, I should have canceled this appointment. John? I can see you're still not complying with our treatment plan. At this point, I'm not sure what else to do to help you. This moment, Dr. Larkhart remembered something that you told him recently. What if John is not compliant because the treatment plan is overburdening him? Dr. Lockhart is referring here to collaborative medicine, a patient-centered approach that tailors the treatment plan to the reality of a patient's life. This approach, which takes into account the perspectives of different health professionals, can help patients comply with treatment by minimizing the treatment burden on their lives. Hey, I'm glad you're here. My patient, John Grasso, is here again. And uh, I think what you were telling me last week about tailoring the treatment plan to the reality of the patient's life could help me in creating a better treatment plan for him. Can you take a look at his history and help me find what I'm missing? As part of Dr. Lockhart's team, you promptly agree to his request. In this folder, you have everything that you need to get started. Now, I've got some missing information locked in this room, but I've also got some riddles that'll help you find it. You got 50 minutes to figure this out. Good luck. The game is on, but before you enter the exam room, there are five game rules you need to know. Rule number one, respect any sign that indicates an object is not part of the escape exam room experience. Rule number two, don't use your muscles to open objects in the room. Rule number three, don't take photos or videos inside the room. Rule number four, follow the clues and solve the riddles in the order they appear in the game. Removing clues from where they belong ahead of time can throw you off course. Rule number five, if your group needs a hint and everyone agrees, raise your hands. You can ask for a maximum of three hints during the game. Keep in mind that every hint you use adds one minute to your overall time. To exit the room, you need to solve all the riddles. You will only have 50 minutes to escape the exam room. Good luck. Okay, so this was, this was the video that they would see at the, uh, at the beginning of the experience and to put everything into context uh, and then 
they were taken to their rooms and and the clock started and given their 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 50 minutes to get out or or not get out depend you know as the as the case may be and so then at the end of that they'll watch they watched this video here which kind of wrapped everything up before they started their uh reflection experience so we'll go ahead and, and watch this real quick i see that you found all my notes and insights that were in the exam room i do hope they weren't too hard to find did you get a chance to look at the information? I know that there's something that I'm missing that's preventing John from complying with his treatment plan. I just don't know what it is. Do you have any suggestions? Now it's your turn to work with your team to use the collaborative medicine approach to do the following. Number one, identify why John Grasso is struggling to adhere to his current plan of care. And number two, develop an interprofessional plan of care that fits John's needs and lifestyle. Remember that collaborative medicine is a patient-centered approach that tailors the treatment plan to the reality of a patient's life. This approach, which takes into account the perspectives of different health professionals, can help patients comply with treatment by minimizing the treatment burden on their lives. So, this was the part that I was most excited about because a lot of times you don't get the, that opportunity to see did did you actually do what you set out to do and you know uh, you know what they they set out to do is create this experience where these students had to learn to listen to each other um, and then they had to learn to look at more than the numbers and and the way this experience was designed. Um, and, and the great thing and, and the funny thing is is some of the the you know to be able to monitor and watch you know through a, through a two-way mirror watch the the students get through these things and, and see some of these faculty members just get so ramped up and why why did you not see the why did you not find the and, and all those things um a, a lot of it upon reflection the, the students learned it was because they were looking at blood pressure they were looking at um, you know, uh, their cholesterol count and all these numbers and all these things and not kind of thinking uh, uh, about John Grasso's story. And, you know, 60% of the students did not escape. Um, so you see that we almost escaped the exam room. Um, the fastest time was uh, around 29, uh, 51. Uh, and the average was, uh, you know, time uh, to escape was about 39, 53. But there was a lot that, I mean, up until the the last minute, including um, you know when uh, we talk about game development and things, I know one of the things that Monica is always hounding is test, 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 test. And one thing that we were able to do, uh, uh, luckily, the week before, is uh, have faculty and staff run through uh, run through the program, and so we were able to kind of, uh, based on that, find um, uh, you know maybe where some some pitfalls were, and actually based on that, we. Uh, Comparing the first year that we ran this to this time, the second year, we saw uh, some places where um, people really got caught and, and couldn't figure out the uh, the clues. And so we're able to kind of develop new hints and things that we're able to kind of incorporate. But during that, um, uh, we'll talk about it in a little bit later, uh, during that test, you know, they almost did not make it out as a result of, you know, not listening to each other and, and those things. So it really kind of uh, pushed home the point. Um, of of the importance of this inter interdisciplinary uh, uh, collaboration and learning to listen to each other. So uh, I'll go ahead and let's look at one of the clues. So when uh, the students would first walk into the escape room, they were given uh, a chart uh, of John Grasso's, and and this is his health chart, and not told you know where to go. What's the first clue going to be? So if you were to look over this chart, you would see at the bottom the first clue. So uh, I'll go ahead and read that to everybody. Uh, securing patient patient information is a top priority. That's why I keep it locked away, including parts of John's patient information. Lately, I've been struggling to remember my lock combinations and which combination opens which locks. Hopefully, the clues I leave behind will help you open all locks. Talk about a tough time. I know John is having a tough time too. 
he doesn't seem to want to take the first step in managing his illness. This first step, though, will get him going down the right path. To find this path, he needs to come to the table and help me out, help me help him out. So that was the first clue that hopefully they would find by looking at the chart. So based on that first clue, where would be the, where would you look for the next clue in the room? The table. Okay, the table. Maybe more specific. Anything about that clue? That... Well, for me, I've been looking for a patient table. Mm -hmm. So I guess the silver one, but that looks more like a surgical tray than a patient table. Anyone else remember some remember anything different from the uh, um, from the clue that stood out? Well, or the cabinets, the step stool, first step. Okay. There you go, first step. Right. So yeah, and 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 you guys are suffering a little bit from you know not you know uh, uh, the 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 allied health students, the medical students would know right away that that's that's the you're right that that's the table. But yeah, so the first step um, would be where that first clue was hidden. So this kind of gives you an example of of the the type of clue that um, that the students were experiencing. Um, and so we've actually put together, uh, and, and you'll recognize Andrew in this video, a walkthrough video that we'll go through really quickly. This will take you through uh, from the beginning almost to the end of, of the escape room to kind of see how it was all put together. Um, so let's watch this real quick. Welcome to the Escape the Exam Room experience. After pre-briefing, we come here to the exam room. First thing the participants will do is grab the patient chart, and into the room we go. Once inside the room, take a look at your patient chart. We've got two pages here of information. It just so happens that the first intro riddle here is at the bottom, and it tells us to go to the first step. After thinking about that, we'll head to the first step at the patient table. Here we go, riddle one. Riddle one gives us a little math to do, and it's going to help us solve the code that will get us into the yellow box. It just happens that the yellow box is right over here. Once we put in the code, we're in. We find our first puzzle piece. We'll come back to that in a minute. We're going to collect three. And riddle two. Riddle two leads us to the blood print blood pressure cuff. All right, let's go take a look. And in the blood pressure cuff, we find riddle number three. Riddle number three leads us to under the sink. Sink and under here have a little bit of distinction. And looking under the sink, oh, here it is, riddle four. And riddle four is interesting because it's got two messages. We've got some words that have underlined letters that say under the emergency cart. And then another message here that helps us find the secret code is green, orange, white medicine. So two things are happening here under this emergency cart. Let's take a look under the emergency cart. This would actually be slid to the back and pulling out the cart. We have the car, uh, it's pulling out the cash box. We realize we don't have the code yet. So let's take a look for the code. Going back to riddle four and reading the secret code is green, orange, white medicine. You know what? That might be the medicine bottles. Taking a look in the medicine bottles, we discover there's two green ones. And after we go through all of them, we realize there's two green, four orange, and six white Tic Tacs in this case which gives us the code for the box, two, four, six, and we're in. This cash box gives us a UV light. We don't know yet what to do with that. Gives us the next riddle, our second puzzle piece, and this, this is a cryptics. But we can't get in because we don't know the code yet. Here we see riddle five, where have I seen these before? This will lead us back to our patient chart, where upon inspecting the patient chart, we find the letters 
that we need to get into the um, cryptics, which is listen. After we get into the cryptics, we'll have riddle six. All right, I figured out the code. It's listen. And I'm in. Inside the cryptics, I have riddle six. If only John would see, my plan will help him be as healthy as a honeybee. Imagine getting third row seats at a concert where you'll be in the first two seats. Okay, so where, where does that lead me? Right over here to, hey, the eye chart. And in the third row, first two seats, three, seven. Okay, I've got two numbers, but I don't know what I'm going to do with those just yet. But I do see right up here, I've got one more lock, and it's four digits. Further inspection of this eye chart, well, it leads us down here to another riddle, riddle seven. Things are happening in his personal life can shine a light on how to create this plan. Oh, the light. You know what we got? In the, we've got a light right here. Now we just got to figure out where it goes. Searching all over the room. Oh, here it is. This chart, there's an eight, and a five. So we have three, seven, eight, five. Let's try that in a combination. And sure enough, we're into the cabinet, the last location. Inside the cabinet, a white box. Let's see what's inside. Oh, we have our third and final puzzle piece. We have a Caesar cipher. We're going to need that for something. And riddle eight. So that was kind of that took you almost to the end of the escape room. And that kind of gives you just really I know that was kind of a brief, super quick run through of, of kind of how all the, the riddles kind of uh, piece together. And um, it, it, incidentally, I'm the one that got to design all the, the, the art, including the um, uh, the prescription bottles, which the RX number was eight, six, seven, five, three, oh, nine, which was totally lost on the students. Uh, and also, uh, Andrew can uh, can tell you that he had to actually take away the Tic Tacs from me because, uh, among other things, I'm an addict, Tic Tac addict, and we were not able to fill all the bottles because I, the orange ones are really, really good. Uh, and so, anyway, I had to kind of go back to the store a few times to make sure that we had enough Tic Tacs for six rooms. Um, so, we got almost to the end of the escape room. Uh, and I think the last thing that we saw was Andrew had op opened up and, and there was Riddle 8 and there was also a, uh, a Caesar cipher. Um, and so well, just completed the exam room tour. So what I would like to do now <laughs> is I created a digital version of the final clue. So what I, uh, I'm going to drop, let me see if I can get to this URL without messing everything up. I'll drop this URL in the chat. And uh, my hope was that we would go back into our breakout rooms and I think give you 10 minutes uh, to, to see and use this digital version and just kind of figure it out yourself to see if you can read this this uh, final riddle and, and solve. Uh, up till now, the, the, the students have acquired these three puzzle pieces. And so now there's a, a, a final uh, missing word and, and uh, riddle to decode. So I'm going to go ahead and put that in the chat. So like somebody will have to play uh, the scribe, um, you know, because there is some some probably some writing down and decoding to do, but somebody can open that up in their in their browser and, and kind of uh, to run with it. And we'll see yeah. who, who can figure it out in, in 10 minutes. So who 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 got it? Who wants to, to Who's the say answer? What, the, <laughs> what the answer is? Collaboration? Is that the word? No. It is, it is not. Good word. What do you, but what do you call what do you call it with the 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 patience? <laughs> we thought it's it was like, empathy. Uh-huh. Ah. Oh, okay. Here, Jeff, you want the whole phrase? Uh, yeah, what so yeah, what, so what so the, what what would happen is sense. in order for everybody for the students to get out all together, they had to say the phrase. Okay. okay. Well, that's tough. So, yeah, you want to go ahead and, and say the phrase out loud. Uh, for my breakout room, empathy, empathy. is seeing with the eyes of another, oh, no. okay. listening with the ears of another, and feeling with the heart 
yeah. of another. Yep. Yeah, oh, so that's nice, so nice. Nice read. microphone there, John. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and and a very good, very nice voice. Yeah. So this is is the solution. Empathy is seeing with the eyes of another, listening with the ears of another, and feeling with the heart of another. So you know they they if you looked at that first, um, let's see if we can go back to that clue. Let's see where are we at. Ooh, didn't go back far enough. In Riddle 8, uh, it tells you um, that we've had to shift his appointment three times. So hopefully, you know, you understood that that meant that you needed to shift the the, uh, <clears throat> the cipher three steps, and that helped you to decode everything. So who had trouble finding out the word empathy? We just didn't get there yet. We ran out of time. We found the word, we came up with the word empathy from the recording, but we okay. didn't get the cipher part. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. So, but what the, the, re, the reason I asked though is, is, I don't know, for some reason, my tendency is as soon as I see a QR code is to scan it. But um, what was interesting about the testing that we did, it actually included some IT professionals and some people from our own staff um, didn't see the QR code, did not just kind of walked around. And a matter of fact, uh, somebody actually said, well, well, gosh, maybe should we, we, should we scan the QR code? No one was paying attention to her. And because no one was listening to her, she didn't speak up again. So they almost did not make it out. I mean, it was, you know, down to seconds. And again, you know, to be a monitor and just kind of like, oh gosh, how can you not see it? Finally on a whim, somebody scanned that QR code they were able to see the video and, and get their way out. So now for those of you that did not scan the QR code, this is what the QR code would have gotten you. So this was the final riddle. It doesn't seem like Dr. Lockhart understands that life hasn't been easy for me. I'm very stressed out at work. I'm concerned about my job, especially because I needed to support my family. All my stress at work and at home leaves me with no motivation or time to do work around the house let alone exercise, if only Dr. Lockhart had empathy. Empathy is definitely the key. So hopefully from there you would have gleaned that empathy was was the, the, the secret word. And I'll, yeah. I'll tell you just a stupid aside story. Um, because I had had that health scare and thought I was diabetic and all these things, I made some life changes and actually had a kind of a massive weight loss. That's the tendency for me. So I lost about 60 pounds but was also required to be this grumpy fat person for the, for the, the video. And I, I, my memory is that it was in the middle of a hot Georgia summer and I had to wear that jacket stuffed with, with pillows and things just to kind of make me look overweight. So the being grumpy and the, the, the looks and all that, not really a, much of a big acting job. It was, eh, it was, it was misery for sure. So that was the uh, escape room experience. And, and again, um, reflection it does afterward you know the, the the students got together and and andrew actually corrected me 60 percent this year actually did make it out so there was a 40 percent that did not um but they got to reflect on why they did not and and a lot of it was they weren't listening to each other or they were concentrating on numbers i think the first year we had uh, somebody look at that nutrition chart and actually look up different nutritional values and things and it just wasted so much time instead of remembering that they're listening to John's story there, you know, the clues were, you know, uh, this was designed that anybody actually could have gotten through it. You know, you really didn't have to have a whole lot of medical knowledge because the, the point of the whole thing was to learn to listen, learn mm -hmm. to listen to the patient's story. That's where the clues were. And so uh, it was great to, to have the students reflect on possibly why they did not get out. Um, so that was that was the escape room experience. And so now, I, I, you know, the question I'm posing to you guys is, is how would you create a, a similar experience? Uh, you know, something that was that was, you know, I, I created a digital version of the uh, that last clue. But there was something really powerful about having that experience face to face. Um, you know, first off, from a. Uh, uh, organizational standpoint, it was great to see that we were able to kind of organize this. And actually, Andrew needs 
to get all the credit for the level of organization that we had to be able to move this 150 students, you know, through this experience and then actually ensure that they got something out of it and they actually learned. Um, but the fact that, you know, you guys talked about at the beginning of, of the session when you talked about the escape room, just the anxiety and all those things, you know, and the timer going and all that and, and being together and all that, there, there was just, there's something about that experience where you're really kind of forced to to either listen to each other or fail. So that, that I think, uh, you know, we've kind of toyed with making this a digital escape room, but I, I don't think you could get the same experience from... Uh, this being done digitally, uh, you know, I think that that it would probably be good, but it would it wouldn't be the same. The, they wouldn't be taking away from it what what I feel like they took away. So anyway, the 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 question I guess to think about um, is is how how would you do something similar, or what what can you what can you see in this maybe, or what questions do you have maybe about the process or or any of that 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 you could maybe apply to into your own context. Hey Jeff, a quick question. Sure. The the principle of, you know, you need to listen, you know, you need to empathy it basically. In the pre-brief or any of their prior instructions, were they given any learning about that whole concept of working together and how to work together? Uh so that they they were um th there was a whole beginning session where they're introduced to that concept you know, at least talking about it and giving some leading questions and, and some discussion and and what do they think this is. And I and I think prior to this, and Andrew, you can correct me if I'm wrong, they have experienced this in the classroom. But, you know, there's a difference between um, being lectured on a thing and, okay, based on, you know, and then actually having to, to do it. And, and what was interesting is, you know, uh, the other kind of things that we learned is that students don't read. And students don't pay attention to all those things, but all the rules that we gave them, they violated all of them. They, you know, um, did the clues out of order, despite being told to do them in order. They touched the things that they weren't. We had people climbing up on cabinets and all these things. Um, you know, uh, again, I told you about how the our first set of cryptics were actually broken, even despite them being told not to muscle anything. We had one uh, student, a, a, a nursing student, she actually lifted her hand up into the, the cabinet. Um, you know, despite it being locked, you know, which again, okay, learn from what you, the next year we, we learned to not uh, put those things in visit, you know, where they could actually see them. We put them in a special box and stuff. So gosh, that was a lot of words to answer your question. Yes. I think that they had the, that they had been exposed to that concept before, but this was really kind of meant to drive, drive that home. And hopefully it did. Okay. Thanks. One of the escape rooms I attended, they had um, little stickers on things to look for, especially for, because some people would get into like the computer equipment that was left out as a prop or, you know, phones and, you know, all that stuff like looking. Yeah. So they put a little buster sticker on things that were like, yeah, don't, don't touch this. this or don't go there. This is the size of the cards with big, bold print and graphics that we made that we taped with big black gaff tape uh to do not touch a thing yeah they they didn't look at it still didn't work yeah wow. there were there were do not touch signs on certain things especially the emergency cart because it's or a crash cart and because medical students train in there they were not allowed to open that at all because everything is in a specific place so that it simulates the real emergency room situation and so we actually had to tape the drawers shut to keep them out and we still sometimes had to stick our head in there and say, stop and don't touch that. Yeah. And I, and I own a college student at home and I can attest that he doesn't listen or read. Uh, interestingly enough, <laughs> neither do adults or faculty for that matter. These academics don't know how to read, especially an email. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, just, you know, in, in spite of best efforts, but that's kind of how we learned lessons learned the, the second round that we did we were able to make a few changes again still the the, the students didn't pay attention i have well, an thank example you. thank you so much oh. jeff for bringing this and andrew i'm so glad you could join in this is amazing and exciting stuff you guys already know that i want to know more about this and, and i want to play so um uh thank you very much 
Um, do make sure you download the chat because you're getting some positive comments in there. I'd like to turn it over back now to Monica. She's going to talk about our new exciting Game Garage community. Thank you, Renee. And that was, of course, awesome, Jeff. I knew it would be. It was a lot of fun. Uh, and thank you for you know pulling back the curtain to share that with us. And that, Absolutely. again, is an example of what happens and why we wanted to make the Game Garage more of a community that people can actively go to uh, and ask questions and uh, have just-in-time learning and have examples from our master craftsmen like Jeff and the many others who are master craftsmen. So as we're launching our new Game Garage, we're going to be holding it on the first and third Friday of every month. So that will be our live session like we're doing now. And the one that's coming up on October 6th going to specifically focus on AI, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But while we're not here in our live sessions, it's going to be an ongoing active community. So it'll have a place where you can log in and uh, there'll be gamified learning that cur cur current courses that we have, but also our master craftsmen are creating courses. And we'll also have uh, Courses that, of course, move you towards certification if you're interested in that, uh, every different topic out there. If you're looking at how can I gamify, whether you want it in some kind of platform specifically, some kind of authoring tool. So we'll have an abundance of those courses. I love this because we're using the idea of this with our Gamacon, and you can just see how active it is, and people haven't even met each other yet. So we, we opened up a topic-specific chat for Gamacon, and people are out there actively using it. And we're going to be doing that here in our community also. So like, let's say, for example, that you do have a specific question about an authoring tool, like let's just pull Articulate Storyline, and you are like, I cannot figure this out. I know I've done this before. How do I do this? There'll be specific chats like Articulate Storyline, there'll be PowerPoint, there'll be mechanics, there'll be personas, any topic that really is of interest to you. There'll be a chat set up where you can go out and ask and get questions. We do have, uh, Renee's done so much research on this and we're just so excited because you know if you've been using artificial intelligence, especially if you put in anything about gamification, what it gives you is pretty generic. Uh, and a lot of it's not even correct. Um, for example, I have written books that I didn't even know I wrote. I think I need to have AI help me to write them now, but um, things like that, but really specifically about gamification design. And so we have, uh, we have, we have already kind of peeled back, scraped all of Jonathan's research and his writing. And so everything from our website, from our books, and we have customized AI so that you'll get accurate information on gamification design. So no more things about player types or four um, quadrant personas or anything like that. This is accurate, proven time and time again, tested how to design gamification for adult learners. And you'll get you'll be able to use the custom AI to ask those kind of questions. We'll of course have just-in-time learning that you'll be able to go out there and do it asynchronously. So those would be quick hits, short courses on a specific game, gamification, game-based learning topics. And where this is one of the things I'm most excited about because I felt like we should have been doing this all along is just some simple challenges. So something simple like how Jeff put out there to us the challenge tonight, like how would we take, like his was a lot more like with the videos, I mean, a lot more time and intricacy of the design than we you would even have to do. But like, how could you design an escape room? Or how could you, what would you do to teach a specific topic? How might you make that game-based? Whether it's low-tech, high-tech, asynchronous, virtual, whatever that format might look like. So we'll have uh, bi-weekly challenges that you can enter. And I think the thing that you know about this community is that we don't have, I don't, it was referred to to me as a one-upmanship when it was explained to me that we don't have that here. This, this person who is involved in a lot of groups said that that's the one thing they saw right away is that no one's trying to prove they're smarter than the next person. In fact, you're probably like me, the more you learn, the more you realize I really don't know nothing. And so 
the challenges will just be fun, but we, of course, will have winners, people who do uh, claim that they uh, will give them that recognition that they had done the best job on that, had done. Is that, I don't even know if that's English. All right. And then we'll also have exclusive access. So you will have exclusive access to different uh, courses and information and coaching. And that all comes with you choose the level of your membership. So if you just want like a small component of it, you get to choose that. GameCon 48V comes as part of the membership. So you would get free registration into GameCon 48V, which is uh, we kick that off on it's a leap year next year. So we're kicking it off on leap year day, nice. February 29th. So that to me sounds like a lot of fun. So you will be deciding the depth of your membership, however deep you want to go. The very cool thing for us is that our master craftsmen, our certified master craftsmen will always have complete access and they will be contributing like Jeff just did tonight and adding to the knowledge base. And so our master craftsmen will be actively involved with it. Uh, you can see the link up there for the Game Garage site. It is still under construction. It is still very rough. If you want to go out there and, and look around a little bit, you can feel free to go out there and look. But we've got about two more weeks of work on it that we want to do. But we're waiting until after this weekend when GameCon is over before we go out there and dig. But you are welcome. It's sententiagamification.com forward slash game hyphen garage. And you'll see the under construction page if you want to go out there and start digging. So I just wanted to let you know about that. We really won't be opening registration officially for it until October 1st, but you can go out there and start looking around. We'll be starting to populate it with more information and courses and, and circles, which are the communication circles, so that you'll be able to uh, see what is coming up. And then we'll play with our custom AI on our first session that we'll have in October, which is October 6th. So that's all I have to share with you tonight. You, of course, can send me an email at any time with any questions that you have. Thank you, Tabitha. Looking forward to having Tabitha contribute as a master craftsman into the, into the group. That'll be great fun. Really great. So that's it for tonight, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the grand reopening. We're still a little bit dirty. Still got a little bit of, uh, what's that? What are those signs they put up in hotels? Please excuse our mess while we're remodeling so we still have a little bit of that dust laying around but i think you'll be able to see that we've got great things coming renee anything you wanted to add about the chat or anything else about the game garage oh i'm really excited about that about that chat feature because um when i went into chat gpt and asked about gamification i got points badges and leaderboards and quests and not much else and and so what i put together now is bringing in uh, how, how many um, mechanics do you have in uh, in your book, Jonathan? Yeah, there's 160 there at some point. I'll, we'll make it because uh, I'm up over around 210 now. So at some point that'll be inside the chat. All of those will be inside the chat. That's good. So now when you ask questions in this particular chat, which is only going to be available to our community, uh, when you ask questions inside the chat, it knows all that stuff. So that's exciting. Yeah. And we'll be learning about that, I believe, on the 6th of, uh, of October. Is that correct, Monica? That's, That's right. Woo! Thank you. All right, then, everyone. Thanks for hanging out with us. We love our game garage. We're so happy that it's back. Uh, we'll see you all on the 6th. And any questions you have in the meantime, feel free to shoot me an email. Probably won't be answering much over the next 72 hours or so as we head to New Orleans. Uh, but if you will be in New Orleans, be sure and, and make sure and come up and say hi and stop me if you are there. Would love to meet you face to face. So thanks so much, everyone. We'll see you October 6th. Have a great night. Great weekend. Mm -hmm.